So we're going to talk about ASICs. And there's a couple of disclaimers first. Uh, so ASICs, Magic, and Professional Wrestling are all very closely guarded secrets. Uh, speaking publicly on them, they are shrouded in heavy NDAs. Uh, it's a good way to get black bagged. Uh, everything that I talk about, I ended up finding public references for. I ended up having to cut some stuff because I knew it as fact, but couldn't easily confirm it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's scary. All of the dates are based on either public switch or chip announcements. It doesn't mean they're shipping or widely available, but there was a press release somewhere with a timestamp on it that I could, I could reference. Uh, and if you make chips, uh, please don't sue me or get me fired. I like what I do. Uh, I'm just trying to educate the masses. So uh, let's talk a little bit about who this is for. There, there are a bunch of, not a bunch, but there are a handful of other ASIC presentations out there that are phenomenal. Um, there's a good one by David Sachs and Peter Jones from Cisco Live. Some of the Cisco Live presentations on uh, Nexus architecture are really fantastic. I'm going for something a little bit different. Um, really expecting, look, you know what an ASIC might be. You have some knowledge of software. You're not really an expert in either of them. Uh, specifically, I'm not looking for ASIC experts. Uh, this is definitely a good enough presentation. There's gonna be something that I say, and somebody who's built chips is gonna be pedantic and be like, oh my God, that's definitely not how Sirdos works. Yeah, that's not, I don't care. Not my problem. <laughs> Uh, you know, this, this presentation, I believe, gives the imposter syndrome seal of approval because uh, I feel good about it, but I don't actually know. Uh, so if you have comments, uh, Slack is good. Twitter's great. Uh, and if you have complaints, I really don't care. <laughs> That's amazing. I told you I'm a pot of coffee deep. We're going to we're going to hit this hard today. Uh, all right, so some qualifications. Uh, so first, some bad news. Uh, I was a B minor, B minus average in computer science. Uh, I've never actually taken a physics class. I started to in high school, did not get accepted to the college that needed a physics credit, so I dropped that class. Uh, I am afraid of electricity, in which I once had to call the maintenance person to help me replace a thermostat, because I was afraid of shocking myself and couldn't figure out how to use a voltmeter. And I can't spell oscilloscope. And if you look closely, it's misspelled. <laughs> but there's good news. There's actually a reason you should keep listening. Uh, so I spent about five years in Cisco TAC doing routing protocols. And so the kind of stuff that I had to do on the escalation team was, hey, every 50 minutes, my traffic engineering tunnel fails over and I lose some traffic. Why? Oh, it's because of the speed of route install into this line card based on the speed of the ASIC to the NP, uh, or, hey, how do I optimize my uh, SRAM tree for route prefix installation because I'm not hitting the data sheet numbers for what you say I should be able to do. So I've seen a lot of this stuff in practice. I just have no idea how it's done in the lab. Uh, today, I do a lot of large scale data center designs. So I'm having conversations all the time with uh, enterprises and customers about, you know, what ASICs exist, what's the marketplace look like, who's good at what, um, trying to understand, at least to, in English, uh, what does the ASIC do well and not do well. Uh, and I oftentimes act as an ASIC translator internally. I get to be part of the conversations, uh, you know, hey, this thing sounds really cool. Is anybody going to buy it? Or does this sound like vaporware? Should we spend engineering cycles actually seeing if their claims are valid? So I think a lot about ASICs. I interact with ASICs a lot. Um, I'm just not the electrical engineering guy. So I have a ton of stuff, not a ton of time. Um, we're going to work through a little bit of this. Uh, so how are ASICs made? Uh, I assume magic. I don't really know. I'm a software guy. I've told you this. So we're going to talk about something else. There are other presentations that talk about making ASICs. This is not one of them. So what I want to start with is, you know, more practical uh, CPUs versus ASICs. 
so an ASIC is an application specific integrated circuit. So I literally take gates and circuits and I weld them onto a board uh, to do a thing. Uh, so there's no flexibility. So I can add two numbers, but I can never subtract. I can never multiply. Uh, it's a series of gates that do these things. Um, this is why network devices are made out of ASICs because what they end up doing is looking at a 32-bit packet, packet header over and over and over again. So that ASIC is extremely good at looking at a 32-bit packet header but if you had a 34-bit packet header, it just couldn't do anything at all. Uh, ASICs tend to be in anything with lots of ports at high speed. The next step along the spectrum is an FPGA, uh, Field Programmable Gate Array. Uh, it's like a changeable ASIC, so it's not as welded. Basically, I have the ability to write software and install that software onto the FPGA and make it flip some stuff around. Um, so it's not as fast as an ASIC, but more flexible. Generally, they take more power. Um, hmm. The ASR1000, uh, that's QFP processor, is kind of sort of an FPGA. Um, it's a little bit different, more complicated than that, but for the sake of this conversation, it's an FPGA. And if you don't think it is, then refer to the slide about how I don't care about that opinion. <laughs> So this is a spectrum of trade-offs. So on one side, we have CPUs that are super flexible and can do anything. It's all sitting in memory, but at the trade-off of speed. GPUs are much faster, a little bit less flexible, but it can still write kind of arbitrary programs for a GPU. FPGAs and then ASICs further down that speed versus flexibility. And so it's all a trade-off. And we're going to come back to this over and over again. Everything is a trade-off. There are no 3.2 terabit CPUs, and there are no ASICs that support all features like a CPU. You know, I can't build ASICs that do IPv4, IPv6, deep packet inspection, 3.2 terabits, um, you know, all of those things at once, because it would have to be basically infinitely large and infinitely expensive. So again, on compromises, everything is a trade-off. It's basically power versus space versus heat versus cost, versus features, versus speed. Uh, so I have to manage all of those components and figure out what to optimize for. So some examples. The Nexus 3548 from Cisco came out, I don't know, almost 10 years ago now. It was ultra low latency. They're all about 50 nanoseconds port to port. That's crazy fast. And then you're like, wow, that like how do they do that? That seems to like defy physics. And it does a little bit. Because if you turn on layer two forwarding, it's 190 nanoseconds. So it only can do 50 nanoseconds by basically not doing any decision making and just mirroring, if it comes in port one, send it out port two. There's no decisions, it's just a mirror. So as soon as you make it think about something and do L2 forwarding, you you know triple the latency. And if not you turn on L3, 190 na nanoseconds is slow by any means. Right, it's not. I mean, it's still extremely fast. But just as a demonstration of like, yeah. to get 50 nanoseconds to get all the way down to you know, as fast as humanly possible, uh, they made these sacrifices. They they're like, all right, we'll just throw literally everything away. No ACLs, no forwarding, no learning, no nothing. All we're gonna do is regenerate a signal. Uh, same thing with L3 forwarding, and it has relatively tiny tables. Where this thing was positioned in like trading networks, um, like financial trading, stock trading networks, the table sizes weren't a problem, but that was the trade-off they made. They optimized for low latency, so they were they said, look, we're just going to have smaller tables so we can hit these numbers. If we look at Broadcom Tomahawk, uh, it's a 32 port, 100 gig, 3.2 terabit switch or ASIC. Uh, it has a 16 megabit shared buffer, but not every port gets all 16 megs. It's actually partitioned. Mellanox, Broadcom's uh, competitor, per, uh, commissioned a report uh, called the Tully Report. You can see it at zeropacketloss.com. And basically they found all of the little areas where if you shoot packets at the ASIC just right, it looks real terrible. And so they were able to find some things where, look, one port got 50% of the buffer, and then everybody else got only 10%. Uh, 
Melox, they have a fully shared buffer and low latency. It really sounds like magic, uh, but it's only 64 ports. So if I take a 32 by 100 gig switch, I cannot break out all the ports like I can on other 100 gig switches. So that was the trade-off Mellanox made there. Hmm. The big thing when it comes to time to market with these ASICs a lot of times is, you know, what is this, there's a TikTok cycle and I'll talk and show this a little bit more later within the ASICs, but everybody's pretty close at this point. I mean, Cisco, and I'm. this isn't vendor FUD, but Cisco had a super clear advantage five or six years ago. They were using some Broadcom stuff. They glued on some Cisco stuff next to it to really fill in some gaps. But if you look at their latest generation of ASICs, like, I, I actually think they're a lot less compelling than the generation before. Like, cool, I get really advanced NetFlow. I, I don't know how, how interesting that is to most folks. But when it comes to speeds and feeds and routing and switching and encapsulation, uh, it's, it's looking pretty similar now. Hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's becoming a one to three year gap at most. And again, I'll show you a timeline in a little bit, but you know, if you don't like what's out there, you can, if you can just hang out for another you know, 18 or 24 months, I bet the next generation of chip is gonna start shipping pretty soon and you can just get that next one. Um, it, it's really a very different world in the chip space than it was five or 10 years ago where new chips came out every 10 years. It is much more like a one to three year TikTok cycle. Uh, and again, everybody is optimizing for different things. So in this, I'm not saying Tomahawk is bad or Mellanox is bad or the 3548 is bad. Every one of those companies made a choice on what to optimize for to build their ASIC to make it and ship it on time. And so you just have to start to understand what is that ASIC, what is that company optimizing for and what did they give up along the way? And I'll, I'll give you some suggestions of what to ask and how to have that conversation here in a few minutes. Any questions so far? Nothing that's come in, Pete. So I think we can keep rolling. All right. So within an ASIC, there's a pipeline and so it's literally the series of circuits that do specific actions. So this is an example of a pipeline from a Trident 2 ASIC. Uh, I'm not gonna walk through the whole thing, but the important thing is you see, look, I do an L2 lookup and then I do an L3 lookup and then I process ACLs. As I move down this pipeline, this conveyor belt, I can't go backwards. I can't do an L3 lookup and then do another L2 lookup. The pipeline determines that feature set. Some feature sets simply do not exist. This is like when TAC tells you this is a hardware limitation, what they're effectively saying is this thing is not built in the pipeline. It is physically impossible on this switch. There so, is so no, for, go ahead. So for example, Pete, a lot of chips, well, maybe it's different now, but you couldn't do VXLAN routing with a lot of these chips for, for instance. That's exactly right. Um, so a pipeline could be limited to one action like a VXLAN decamp or a layer three lookup and not both. And so what ended up happening is the next generation of chips extended that pipeline and added another layer to a layer three lookup engine in the middle, like in that pipeline. So I could do L3 lookup, VXLAN decap, L3 lookup. If you had the misfortune on the 6500, um, it couldn't do GRE and MPLS. You had to turn on this thing called MPLS GRE tunnel research. And it would actually pass the packet back through the pipeline a second time internally. Um, some, you can actually do this either, some ASICs allow you to do it internally. They'll actually take some ports and just plug it back into itself. Um, so Arista, for example, has supported VXLAN routing on some of their platforms that nobody else supports VXLAN routing on that chip. And you have to be like, whoa, did Arista like figure out some magic and do something crazy? But what they did is they took a 40 gig ASIC, put it in a 10 gig switch and took all that extra bandwidth and just plugged it in back to itself. So it can do this recirculation where it will internally send the packet back through a second time using all of that excess bandwidth. Um, it does double the latency. So if it's a 600 nanosecond switch, you're, all of those packets now take 1200 nanoseconds. Maybe you care, maybe you don't, but again, those are the trade-offs. And, and a lot of this is the magic happens when you build an ASIC 
there's no magic after that. If it seems magical, you just need to scratch the surface a little bit to understand how they pulled it off. Now, Pete, for people that are really interested in the differences between Trident 2 and 3, Tomahawk 2, et cetera, um, we're, we're going to get into some of that, I think, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I've got some slides that'll talk a little bit about those ASIC families. And then another comment that came in is just, uh, you know, like you were commenting on some of the abilities of Tomahawk versus uh, Trident, and uh, mm -hmm. the comment was made here that Tomahawk 2 can actually process L3 lookup and VXLAN in one step, like Trident yep. 2 and 3. Yeah, uh, I believe so. And again, that's that that's that evolution in which Trident 2 couldn't do it. Tomahawk came out after Trident 2 couldn't do it. So then they fixed it in the the and I'll again I'll show this a little bit later. Um, but they fixed it in the feature rich switch, and then that trickles down into the high speed. And so again, there's that tick tock of feature rich, high speed, and they all live kind of a generation behind. And so I think that I'll, I'll clear that up a little bit when I show you a timeline of all of these chips and explain a little bit of what those chip families look like. And Pete, a quick question on how uh, a networking vendor's operating system interacts with an ASIC. Presumably there's some kind of SDK or something between mm -hmm. the ASIC and the OS where the OS is working with the SDK to figure out how to go through the steps. Yeah, usually there's uh, there's a software package that you you purchase or license, or if you built the ASIC like Cisco, they built the software for it, the SDK. And so you program to that SDK, you click compile, and it turns it into machine code for that ASIC. So just like if you write C code and click compile, it uses well-known uh, language to build assembly for an x86 CPU. It's exactly the same for an ASIC. You're building well-known programming for that ASIC. Some ASICs do expose like direct register lookups. So instead of writing the C code, you can go write the assembly and poke the registers and manage things yourself. Um, it's, it's more complicated, uh, but it allows you to work around some of the limitations or bugs that can exist in the SDK. So that's the other thing is like SDKs have bugs. Whether or not you see that as a customer is another question because it's just gonna look like a vendor bug, right? It's gonna look like an Arista bug or a Cumulus bug but it could actually be Broadcom that broke something. Um, and w that vendor has to get a fix from Broadcom, integrate it, test it, validate it, and then give that whole fix to you um, because the SDK broke. And when a, a vendor, you know, if they're vendor A and vendor B are both using the same uh, silicon, they'll say we're getting competitive advantage because of the code optimization we're doing when we compile to the SDK or something like that. That's how they're saying they get these advantages over their competitors. Usually, or or they're doing the manual mode where they're going around the SDK and manually okay. mapping memory and registers and, and things like that. Um, so it, it I'm not going to say that it's not advantageous. It's just more complicated. Mm -hmm. One more quick question, Pete. We were talking about recirculation a minute ago. Uh, you were, and do you happen to know if the Nexus 9Ks and 9Ks uh, do recirculation? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. The one that I can talk about there was for the 9300. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they're still selling, but they had this gigabit uplink module or gigabit ethernet module or whatever they called it, this little daughter car that sat in it. Um, so the, the 9300 itself was a Trident 2. It did not do VXLAN routing, but Cisco went and sold it as VXLAN routing capable. And so what they actually did is instead of doing recirculation through the chip like Arista did, that daughter card had a second ASIC in it. And so every packet went through both ASICs. So one would do VXLAN decap and the other one would do the L3 lookup. Um, so some, so a lot of what I've seen, uh, and I'm gonna admit, I have not looked closely at the Nexus stuff. A lot of how they're solving the recirculation problems is just throwing more ASICs at the problem. Like let's just have two ASICs instead of sending it through the same one twice. Um, the, again, the, some of those Cisco live presentations are really good in that space. I would take a look at those. Um, I, I've just been out of the Nexus 9K game long enough that I, I don't want to speak with authority there. Fair enough. I think that's all the questions we got. All right. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about buffering, uh, my least favorite topic. Uh, and it's because buffering is a religion. Uh, this is Red Sox versus Yankees. Madrid versus Barcelona, UNC versus Duke. Uh, and I actually, to try to be internationally uh, accepting, the All Blacks versus Les Bleus. Apparently it's a rugby thing. 
I don't really actually know, but it's like if you like the Red Sox, I am never going to convince you to root for the root for the Yankees. Um, so I'm going to start with that and tell you some things. The buffering depends on the ASIC and the form factor of the switch. Is it a chassis? Is the ASIC on chip? Or I'm sorry, is the buffer on chip? Are there these external bonus buffers to help you do it off chip? Um, there's a lot of things that kind of go into there. Regardless of religion, buffers mean latency. It, it literally means to buffer or hold a packet. More buffers, more latency. Well, that assumes the port is congested, Pete, right? Yep, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay. Uh, and buffers aren't evil, and it's a question of where and why. So sometimes I do want to buffer and have that congestion and, and hold the packet for, for a couple of microseconds. Sometimes it's better off to just throw the packet away and make TCP update. So we use buffers uh, anytime we store and forward. The buffer would be this storing part of store and forward. As, is, as Ethan said, when I have egress port congestion, I have two inputs going to one output. Uh, however, consider the statistical probabilities of this. I'm not saying it never happens. I'm not saying I've never seen overruns. I'm saying that in most networks that are extremely high speed, like if you have 100 gig links in your data center, think about how long it takes to transmit a packet. I would tell you the numbers, but I'm not good at math. This is part of why I dropped out of that physics class. But it's like super duper duper small uh, versus back in the day with say 100 meg or one gig, which is literal orders of magnitude slower. So the probability of having to buffer a packet for very long is pretty small. It actually gets to the point where, you know, can I, how many servers do I have? How are they sending? And can I actually run into that congestion condition a lot? Maybe I just don't care. Uh, buffers are used when the burst that comes in is greater than the pipeline. So the pipeline I think of as like a, a water wheel. It only spins at a certain speed to move packets through that pipeline. Um, I mean, that speed is measured in gigahertz, so it's really, really fast. Um, but if I have a huge burst, like a 100 gig line rate of 64 byte packets, it's entirely possible that that pipeline does not move fast enough to process all of those packets. And again, it's based on headers, and this is why you see a difference between 64 byte packet performance and say 9,000 byte packet performance. I can push 10 gigs of traffic, but it's the number of headers that I have to look up in that pipeline that matters. And speed change. So anytime I have to go from fast to slow or slow to fast, there's some voodoo that can be done around this that some, some switches do. Um, but basically if I'm coming in at 100, I have to slow down to transmit down to 10. And so I have to put a little bit of that in the buffer. When don't they matter? If I'm doing cut through for same speeds with no congestion, so as soon as a bit comes in my 10 gig port, I can transmit it on a 10 gig port without anybody noticing. Um, otherwise, I'm going to run into conditions when I have buffers. So first, let's talk about shallow buffer. Uh, so a shallow buffer is usually on chip and it's part of the pipeline. This is again, like a little bit more complicated, but work with me here. This is an example of a Trident 3 pipeline, and you see this box down in the bottom right, uh, the fully shared MMU or memory management unit. This is where the packet buffer lives within the ASIC as part of the pipeline. It, it's literally this, this space between the ingress and egress pipelines. Uh, it's not deep. It's generally measured in megabytes. Shallow buffers usually means extremely high speeds, and it can mean, but doesn't necessarily mean lower latency. Um, a big part of this is how, what is the worst case lookup scenario in a deep buffer? If I have to search 16 megs, this, it's gonna take me less time to get to the 16th meg than it is to get to the eighth gig of that, of that table. And so this is why you generally see shallow buffer switches have higher speeds and feeds. This is not usually universally true. Again, you can play some games here. Um, I'm trying to throw out some general, uh, general rules of thumb. One of the things that we should talk about is how chassis are built um, and the buffers on chassis, because they're a little bit different. Um, so in this case, this is an Arista 7300X. This is a high level architecture. I have a pair of ingress line cards. They have one or more 
ASICs with pipelines with buffers on them. In this case, there are two Tomahawk ASICs on each long card. I also have some fabric cards that are going to have fabric ASICs. Fabric ASICs are exactly like line card ASICs. They just optimize for slightly different things because they have smaller lookup tables. Because I'm only sending to, say, eight line cards instead of uh, one million routes. So I can, I can have a smaller table and more speed. Again, what am I optimizing for? What gets added in a chassis to change this? Because each one of these Tomahawks has a little 16 megabit buffer, megabyte buffer. What gets added in a chassis, and this is almost universally true of all chassis, no matter the chip on the card, is what's called a VOQ or a virtual output queue. So these VOQs are what create deep buffered chassis. And it prevents fabric congestion. It does absolutely nothing, or let me rephrase that, it does very little for the line card. It's mainly to prevent congestion across the fabric. Yeah. A packet will live in the VOQ on ingress until it's given credits to be able to send over the fabric. It basically has to say, I have 1,500 bytes to send. Is there 1,500 bytes worth of bandwidth over the fabric right now into this egress line card? And the fabric will go, nope, egress line card's busy. You're going to have to sit and wait a second. So instead of blocking everybody on the fabric, I only block that ingress line card. It's exactly like something like a storage network with SAN and storage credits. A single line card can still have congestion and cause drops, even with a VOQ. So if I have everybody sending into one line card, that one line card, that egress line card is going to be busy and everybody else is going to back up on ingress and can cause problems. There are some ways to fix this by kind of mixing and matching how you do scheduling and queuing and things like that. Um, so I'm not, again, trying to say this is universally broken, but it's another layer of complexity that has to be thought about. Yeah, and at the end of the day, you can only have so many inputs headed for the same output. Exactly. You know, across a fabric, it is what it is. At some point, something's getting dropped. Mm -hmm. It's just the way, that's the way of things. And, you know, and that's exactly what you just said, right? In cast to a line card still exists. I can still have a bunch of people sending into one box. So one thing to know about chassis, though, is they are spine and leaf networks. This is actually a diagram of the Nexus 9500R. Uh, so each line card and the ASICs on that line card build a spine and leaf network into the fabric cards. You just don't know that it's a spine and leaf network. So let's talk about deep buffers uh, and deep buffered chips. Uh, so there is a family of ASICs with deep buffers. These are measured usually in gigabytes instead of megabytes. Uh, oftentimes they not only have a larger buffer on chip, that might be instead of 16 megs, 32 or 64 megs, but they'll have this huge multi-gig buffer off chip. And the way they do this is because it's, it's, it's fast, but it's not L1, L2 cache fast. So it is a slower speed memory. And because it's slower speed, I can afford to buy a bunch of it. You know, nine gigs of L2 cache is going to quintuple the cost of a switch and nobody will buy that. Again, nothing comes for free. That buffer transmit is going to be slower and consistent congestion doesn't matter. Meaning that like, look, I can still overrun a buffer. I can still end up running into persistent latency uh, again because of that buffering. And so this is an image from the NCS 5500, which uses the Jericho chip with off chip memory. Some of the Arista universal routers do the same thing, but basically the chip has a huge buffer and then there's this massive like multi gig off chip buffer. And there's in this case a 900 gig pipe between them. Well, if I have 32 ports sending at 100 gig, I have 3.2 terabits. There is no way that I can transmit packets between the chip buffer and the off chip buffer fast enough to do that. And so really what they're betting on is you're going to get a big burst or this is going to be momentary and it's only going to last a few microseconds. Let me put it in this much slower buffer and then I'll just slowly ease it out at 900 gig, which will be fast enough 
Um, it's interesting, Pete, that this is an NCS 5500, because if I remember what that box is, it's like a multi-appliance kind of a, kind of an edge box that runs a whole lot of different things. So it, it mm -hmm. feels like you know, huge buffers like this are, are very use case specific, like what the, like where this NCS box might be positioned. Absolutely. And this is, uh, I'm just going to skip to the next one, which is my opinion on buffers. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to, this is full on editorial mode. Um, I think buffers make a ton of sense when you have long distance transmission. Um, and, and I don't necessarily mean like trans-Pacific, but, you know, outside of the data center, on the internet edge, um, you know, a single packet loss due to a tiny, tiny bit of congestion can crush TCP round trip time, uh, if, especially if it's high latency RTT. And so, you know what, I would rather buffer for that couple of microseconds when I got that little burst then stomp all over a bunch of TCP sessions within within that edge because they're high latency. This is extremely different than the data center where everything is low latency round trip times. And you know what, like, let me just have TCP do its work. The other reason is because you hate money. Um, <laughs> look, buffers are an insurance policy. I'm not gonna say that you shouldn't buy buffers. I'm not gonna say they don't solve problems, but it's insurance. Right. If I put buffers in the data center, I never have to worry about ever troubleshooting a thing, and I'm going to pay for it on a cost per port basis. From shallow buffers, literally everything else. Uh, so if it's not really Internet Edge or something like that, I almost always, I mean, there aren't a lot of use cases where I've seen that makes sense for deep buffers. Uh, all buffer marketing is cooked, and anybody that tells you otherwise is lying. Uh, every Arista white paper that talks about big buffers is refuted by a Cisco white paper that talks about medium-sized buffers that's refuted by a Broadcom paper that talks about shallow buffers. Mm -hmm. Like, I can play games with packet rates and packet sizes and the ports that it comes in on and inter-packet gaps and TCP sessions, and I can basically make anything look the way I want it to. Um, so, you know, go sodium overload when you when you use some salt on that on that marketing and again it's a religious debate you had something ethan well kind of a kind of an off to the side but but related question to buffers now nfv devices they're using x86 for forwarding so totally different architecture than what we what we have really been talking about mm -hmm. do you think we're going to start seeing configuration options to use nvme you know big big old bus and uh that or maybe ssd as uh, mm -hmm. as additional buffer I, th I think for those, it'll just be cheap enough to use regular RAM um, and just say, like, put, you know, 6,428 gigs of RAM in there. The big thing there is, can I put a packet into, take it off the NIC, put it into memory, do stuff on it in x86, take it out of memory and put it back on the NIC fast enough? And so, like, we're at a point where, like, one port or two ports of 10 gig is extremely easy to do. Like, I can do that at line rate on an x86 box. Um it's the like two ports of 200 gig where that falls over. And I think it's just a matter of time. Like you'll always see us get there. Um, I mean, the old 7200s were just, a, they weren't x86. They were PowerPC or risk-based processors, but they were just like one gigahertz uh, CPUs. Everything was software forwarded in high speed, regular off the shelf RAM on a regular off the shelf CPU. Um, so it's just it's just time as CPUs and buses get faster, we'll see more stuff move to x86. Another question here is uh, is Broadcom opening things up? I mean, it seems like their drivers, SDKs, APIs have been pretty closed for a long time. Is that changing? Um, they're making little baby steps in that direction. Um, one of the great things is uh, Mellanox and Barefoot are two chip makers who have really come and pushed them really hard. Uh, Mellanox is really big in how open they are. Kind of at every level, they're like, look, you want to do the full open source thing? We'll do that. You want to do the cumulus thing? We'll do that. You want to do something in the middle? Sure. Uh, Barefoot's big thing is programmable pipelines and giving you that access to program out whatever you want. And that those two things in the marketplace are making Broadcom go, oh, okay, like there's competition now. We should, we should try. Um, so you're seeing that movement. Uh, I honestly think Broadcom still has some work to do there, though. Do you happen to be familiar with Corsa gear at all? Uh, mm, not at all. Okay. okay. Uh, so the last thing I'll mention on buffers is uh, 
unless you have real world data, I just don't care. And, and it's not that I don't think your opinion's valid. It's that like, I don't want to debate religion. Uh, I've done this a bunch. It just, it's, you know, uh, it's like talking politics at the dinner table. Just, you're just better to avoid it. Uh, if you have real world data that shows me, hey, we have this use case and this is what we saw, cool. I will absolutely believe you and buy into deep buffers or shallow buffers or medium buffers. Um, but in general, all the data is cooked. It's just religion and we're all making it up as we go along, myself included. And just to, to weigh in, I did a quick look up. Um, it was back in January of this year that uh, Broadcom announced an open source. They were open sourcing their SDK for uh, which chipset was it? Yeah, I think that's the open NSL. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so what they did is they took, say, 20 or 30 percent of their total SDK and they opened up that kind of common chunk. Yep. So it's like, okay, you can do L2 ish and all of the L3, and you know, we're not we're not going to give away multicast though. Mm -hmm. I haven't really looked at it, so don't quote me for truth on what is and isn't in there. But that's that's kind of their their positioning on Open NSL is, it's it's enough to check the open source box, um, but probably not enough to really do it yourself. So let's talk a little bit about the ASIC families and. Uh, I think that I, yeah, I edited this slide last night, but didn't update the title. Uh, so we're going to talk about both Broadcom and Mellanox. Uh, I don't talk about Cisco just because I started doing the research and uh, got lazy and or ran out of time. <laughs> uh, so Broadcom has two main families. Uh, the first one they call Strata SGX. These are their data center switches, mostly 1RU switches, and they're all named after missiles. Um, so the feature-rich line of ASICs are the Trident, Trident 2, Trident 2 Plus, Maverick, Trident 3. And this is the evolution of that family. Their high-speed line is Tomahawk, Tomahawk Plus, Tomahawk 2, Tomahawk 3. The Strata DNX line is their deep buffer chips. They make chips that go into those fabric ASICs um, that I mentioned earlier that live on line cards and are similar but a little different. Um, they're all named after cities in Israel. Um, so buffers in medium speeds. Um, so they're not low speed, they're not high speed, they're somewhere in the middle. Um, so Arid, Coumaron, Jericho, Jericho Plus, Jericho 2. Um, Strata DNX was actually an acquisition by Broadcom uh, a number of years ago. It was actually one of their largest acquisitions in history before this year, at least, when they just started burning money. Um, and it's one of the things about that SDK layer that we talked about to program a chip is up until extremely recently, they were two totally completely different SDKs. So although the Coumaron and the Trident 2 both said Broadcom, building to those switches was actually really comp like super different. Like they might as well have not come from the same vendor. Um, and so that's why you see some kind of spotty support um, across the board. The Broadcom is fixing that. They're doing some work there to unify those SDKs, but um, as I say, a year ago, that wasn't true. Uh, Mellanox. Mellanox only has one family of Ethernet line called the Spectrum. Um, and so Spectrum is both a low latency and a feature rich. Um, Spectrum has been really interesting where uh, they, they sit really somewhere around, if you combined the Tomahawk and the Trident lines together, um, but like I said, they made some other trade-offs, which include things like how many ports can you get out of the switch? So let's look at an actual timeline of history of some of these ASICs. And, and I really think that it highlights the speed and the velocity, as well as what the kinds of trade-offs get made. So Trident 2 was probably one of the most common uh, commodity Broadcom ASICs that was announced at least the first switch I could find from Edgecore was announced in September 2014. So 48 ports of 10 gig, six ports of 40 gig, no VXLAN routing, just L2, L3, and some basic VXLAN. Mellanox Spectrum announced in June of the following year a 32 by 100 gig switch that was VXLAN routing capable, uh, single pass, like really kind of a next generation of ASIC compared to Trident 2. Tomahawk came out in 2016. 
uh, 32 by 100 gig. Spectrum 2 was announced in July of 2017, a 32 by 200 gig. Coomeron, which is our deep buffer, does NAT, does a bunch of MPLS stuff, really an edge box, comes out in August of 2017, and it's only 48 ports of 10 gig, but six ports of 100. The Coomeron that came out in 2017 looks a lot like Trident 2 from the speeds and feeds. And it's because it's very different memory architecture and very different feature set. I cannot give you 3.2 terabits at that uh, buffer and speed as of August 2017. March 2018, both Trident 3 and Tomahawk 3 are announced. Trident 3 does VXLAN routing now, 48 by 25, 8 by 100. Tomahawk 3 is now a 32 by 400 gig switch. Late this year, Jericho 2 was announced, which is now 24 by 100 and 6 by 400. And so it really highlights like how much faster these chips are moving along. And you can really start to see, at least I hope you can see some of this TikTok architecture that's happening where Tomahawk, super fast, feature poor. That's okay because now we have Trident 3 and that fixes that problem not too much longer. And do you know even more bandwidth? We'll have Tomahawk 3 and it's going to be a 400 gig switch, but it's going to have fewer features than Trident 3. Um, and then again, Mellanox coming in here, kind of fitting. I, I think Mellanox has done a good job of fitting right in that space between the feature rich and the high speed Broadcom chips in the data center. And Pete, on these announcements or when the um, ASIC vendors are rolling out their chips, are they working in sort of tandem with the, our switch vendors like the Arista, Cisco's, mm -hmm. et cetera, so that they can ship product right away? Or is there a lag between when the, the ASIC is announced and I'll see, you know, a Trident 3 from a vendor? Uh, yes to both of those. So it depends on the chip and the demand. Um, so like Trident 3, for example, was, was kind of considered the hotness. I think everybody was really excited for Trident 3. It solved a lot of deficits and, and the speeds and feeds problem that we're starting to see in some of these enterprise data centers. And so... I am 100% sure that like Arista and Cisco had their hands on Triton 3s really, really, really early. Like basically as soon as they started rolling off their first one so they could start coding to it. Mm -hmm. In general, uh, what happens is Broadcom will announce a chip. They'll have already notified all their hardware vendors, but they'll announce a chip. Sometime within the next six months of that announcement, they'll start doing samples where basically they'll say like, hey, these should work. We're going to still do a bunch more validation QA we reserve the right to tell you to throw all those in the garbage and send you new ones. Um, but it should be mostly fine. And then you see hardware platforms being announced another, say, six to 12 months after chip announcement. So, folks, I want to acknowledge if you're on the, uh, the the webinar here, we are at the end of the event as far as the official scheduled time. I'm going to give Pete a chance to finish up his slides and uh, – then I'll do a little housekeeping and we'll be done. So we'll be done very shortly here. Yeah, thanks y'all. I've just got, uh, I think two or three more slides. So I'll try to power through. Um, so I wanna touch really quickly on programmable <laughs> chips. Uh, and there are three, three flavors. So there's not programmable. So you have no access to the SDK. You have to license it. And the pipeline is fixed. So this is what we described earlier that if it's not in the pipeline, if it wasn't welded on the chip, too bad. They're semi-programmable. So I can't talk to the SDK, uh, but it's a flexible pipeline. So the SDK could get updated and add new features, but I can't do anything about that. And then there's fully programmable. So it's that same flexible pipeline, but now I actually have full access to the SDK and I can use something like Barefoot's P4 language. And I put flexible in quotations because again, there's no magic. Usually what they're doing is they're just making, instead of one lookup engine, we'll just put a whole bunch of them in a row. And they'll all chain together, but they'll all also have the ability to kick a packet out if it's done. And so a packet comes in and that lookup engine will do work and either forward it onto the next engine or punt it out. And you're now just limited by how many lookup engines are in that, in that chip. And this is basically how every programmable switch on the market works today, if it's higher speed. But let's be honest, uh, you're not gonna program an ASIC uh, it's great for vendors, right? It's good for the cumuluses and the aristas of the world. Uh, but even with something like P4, this is super hard work. 
nobody in enterprise builds custom routing protocols. Why do you think you're gonna build a custom data path? I, I mean, look, prove me wrong. Uh, there was already one of those memes today. Uh, I guess there should be another one. Uh, but I would love to hear it. So I've heard two valid use cases. Uh, you're trying to put custom data in a packet header to do something special, load balancing or whatever. Or you have like stock sheets and a stock ticker. So I've heard of financial companies that want to forward packets based on the stock, not based on the IP header. So I want to send GE to one place and Cisco to another. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to power through my last slide, the questions you should be asking to your vendors. And so as a preface, though, your VAR probably won't know. And no offense to VARs, this just isn't the world they live in. Maybe they do, but they might not. Even your SE might not know. Uh, again, this, is, this gets really, really deep and hairy really, really fast. Uh, but someone inside the vendor knows. So make that vendor earn their keep. Like, tell your SE to go shake the tree until the chip person falls out. Uh, and then go talk to them. And so what you should do is ask what the chip does well. Like, what's their positioning? What are they really excited about? But also everybody should be able to know what it does poorly. Like, what, what was the trade-off that was made? So for whatever magic function, what doesn't it do? If it's low latency or high bandwidth or feature rich, there's some thingy that they gave up. Uh, ask the ask the direct question like, look, if I needed more speed than this chip, do you have another option? If I needed more features than this chip, do you have another option? So again, if I could look at Broadcom and say, look, more speed means Tomahawk, more features means Trident. That helps me position and understand where they're making those trade-offs. And remember, nothing is free. Always remember that trade-off. Mm. That's my last slide. <laughs>